All right, welcome everyone to our April 1st virtual public board meeting for 2021, Brentwood Darlington Neighborhood Association. This is no joke, you are here at this meeting. I promise that's the only April Fool's joke I'll make today. Mm -hmm. um, we have a slight change in our agenda. Pam couldn't make it this evening or will be late if she does make it. And she doesn't have a Southeast Uplift report anyway because of the way the meetings stagger. So um, instead, we're going to have an update on Soak It Week, which is going to be awesome. So, and uh, Derek's going to have some good information on uh, real estate sales in the neighborhood. Sure. My house is worth a lot of money. <laughs> well, you know, that's the good news, Gail. But man, I feel for the first time home buyer. Yeah. You know, I just like, my head's spinning when I'm seeing some of these prices. I'm just like, whoa. Well, we're going to talk more about that in the second half. So if it interests you, save that and we'll see you then. No, um, I'm going to forward that to my mortgage broker. <laughs> quick reminders, I'll go. go through these pretty fast. Uh, all meetings are virtual until further notice. And um, we'll get all these links in the chat here in a minute when I'm done talking. Um, but you can, you're all here. So you all figured this part out. Quick reminder, if this is your first meeting or you're newer to Zoom, some of the things you might be looking for, your screen may look different. This is just an example of uh, buttons you might wanna know about. And it looks like um, this on a smartphone. And if you're on a regular phone, which I don't think we have anybody today, you can dial star six to mute or star nine to raise your hand. Now we're gonna go ahead and do introductions and um, we'll be quick. And then at some point, hopefully our special guest will show. So I will start. I'm Chelsea Powers. I'm the current chair, she, her pronouns. Not very first meeting, been in the neighborhood about six years now. And I first heard about BDNA through a neighborhood uh, night, a national night out event and um, that's it for me. I'll go ahead and just kind of go down my list. If you don't want to introduce yourself, you can just say pass. Gail, you're next on my list. Yay, and you can see me and hear me without tunnel feedback. Uh, she, her, I've been here since 1992. Um, yeah, I live here. Okay. Thanks, Gail. Uh, Machu, you're next on my list. Hi, good to see everyone. Uh, Macho Williams, he, his pronouns. Um, I live very close by. I often walk through Brentland, Darlington every day, uh, just for a reference of how close I am. Um, I owned a home in the area since 2014. However, my family has historical ties going back to when Foster Road was widened in the um, 1930s. Um, just give you a sense of um, place and commit connection to the area. Um, no, other, let's see, what else is the questions? How, how'd you hear about BNA? Um, just real interested in like the, uh, the Masters of Regional Planning, MERP study from Portland State and just some of the uh, missing infrastructure in the area. And it's always fascinated me about um, the many opportunities that exist in Brentwood, Darlington. So glad to see you all. Welcome, we're right. happy to have you here. Derek, you're next on my list. Yes, um, I moved from the neighborhood in 2012. I used he, him pronouns. And um, what do I do? I do outreach. I mail them brochure to new neighbors in the neighborhood. And um, what's my latest discovery? Oh, cauliflower pasta linguine at grocery outlet. It's linguine pasta made from cauliflower, grocery outlet. And that's it. Awesome. Thanks, Derek. Um, looks like Laura Lee, you're next on my list. Hi, I'm Laura Lee, um, uh, she, her. This is not my first meeting. It's probably about my sixth, seventh or eighth. I am the secretary on the board and I bought my house in Brentwood, Darlington eight years ago. And I heard about BDNA by walking to the park and passing by the community center. Wonderful. Next on my list is Stephanie. Hi, I'm Stephanie Frederick. I'm the um, chair of the Land Use Committee. I've been with the 
board ever since I moved here, uh, which was four years ago. And I own a house in the neighborhood. I heard about uh, the Neighborhood Association before I moved here was one of the reasons I wanted to move here. And that's, that's it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Next on my list is Linda. Um, hi, I'm Linda Gold, sir. Um, she, her. Um, I'm the director of the Multnomah County Master Gardener Demonstration Garden um, to the uh, east of Brantwood Darlington Park, excuse me, to the west. And um, we're just uh, getting into uh, fostering community connections. So that's why I'm here. Welcome, Linda. Lynn, you're next on my list. Hello, I'm Lynn. Um, uh, pr pronouns she, her. Uh, it's not my first meeting. I've been on the board for a couple of years now. I'm the uh, treasurer. I've lived in the neighborhood for 27, 28 years. Um, and I heard about the BDNA through a Facebook post. Awesome. And Mary, you're next. Hi, Mary Davis here. Uh, she, her pronouns, uh, not my first meeting. Uh, I bought my house in 1993 and heard about the neighborhood in 1994, about the safety action team. And I currently serve as your informal Leech Botanical Garden liaison. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Uh, next on my list is Eli. Hi, everybody. My name is Eli. I am Representative Jeff Reardon's legislative assistant. I like to come to put faces to names and hear what issues uh, are important to folks in the community. And uh, yeah, thanks for having me. Thanks, Eli. We're always happy to see you. Uh, Kimberly, you're next. Hi, Kimberly DeLeo. I've lived here since 2015. Uh, she, her pronouns. I live here with Jeff Cooley. And we're on Duke and 63rd. And I heard about uh, the association through Facebook. Thank you, Kimberly. Lisa, you're next. Hi, thanks for inviting me. I'm Lisa Patterson, she, her pronouns. And I'm a project manager at the city of Portland in the Bureau of Transportation. And I'm here tonight to talk about the upcoming Brentwood Darlington Multimodal Improvements Project. So look forward to talking with y'all soon. We're excited to hear about it. Uh, next on my list is Maria. Uh, hi, my name is Maria. My apologies for being late, long story. But um, anyway, I'm glad to be here. This is not my first meeting. My pronouns are she and her. I heard about the BDNA uh, Neighborhood Association right around this time of the year for the Brentwood Darlington egg drop, the helicopter thing they did at the park. And um, yeah, been part of the Land Use Transportation Committee. Excellent. Now, did I miss anybody? Okay. I think that we are ready to move on with community announcements. And we start with our um, lovely Green Thumb site. And I know Luke wanted to talk about some learning garden things tonight. So I'm going to go ahead and skip to Linda with Multnomah Master Gardeners and see if we Luke is just running a little late. So go ahead, Linda, take it away. Okay, well, um, last month, I think I reported we had not been able to get into the garden, but we did get the first uh, week of March, we were able to get emergency access to our garden to um, take care of storm damage. We lost a tree and some branches and, um, some other stuff that we had to take care of. And then on March 15th, we were able to start back up at the garden, the master gardeners, a, a limited amount of gardeners uh, for now. And we're just in the process of planting our spring edible crop. And uh, we are also uh, able to maintain the the perennial beds and um, the rest of the garden. And 
right now that's about it. Um, we're hoping for um, more access as time goes on and um, COVID restrictions lift. So hopefully as soon as I know, I will let everyone know that you can come into the garden. <laughs> But for right now, you can't. Sorry. And that's all I have to report this month. Thank you so much, Linda. Looks like uh, we have a new neighbor who just joined. Uh, Hazel, we just finished introductions if you're interested in introducing yourself. I'll give you a moment to connect. Um, and I'm going to go back to Learning Gardens Lab because I don't see Luke tonight but I do have some updates. Um, Hazel, did you wanna introduce yourself? All right. Um, so Learning Gardens Lab has uh, three announcements. There is a March newsletter put out by um, the capstone students during winter term. And I've uploaded that PDF to the BDNA drive and Maria will link that in the chat there if you would like to read it. There's also the LGL Day of Giving coming up in five days and they've got a goal that they're trying to meet. So you can click that link that Maria will put in the chat. Thank you, Maria, and um, donate. And then finally, they're having a plant sale. Again, link in the chat. And those dates are April 24th, May 8th and May 22nd. 10 to 1 and that'll be at the Learning Gardens uh, parking lot there and uh, BDNA will have a table there board members so if you're interested in volunteering at any of those uh, you can come hang out with me and um, more about that as we go. Any questions on Learning Garden updates? All right. Uh, Mary, I will let you take it away with Leech Botanical. Thank you. Uh, we're getting really close to uh, finishing up the punch list for phase one um, development of the upper gardens and we'll have a soft opening, not a grand opening, just a soft opening on Friday, April 16th. So pretty excited about that. Um, there'll be probably some, maybe some more attention from the media. We've got a little attention, which is really cool. I don't have a time, but I'm going to assume that it's the regular 10 to 5 hours for that day for the upper garden. Some of the other news is uh, we our relationship with Portland Parks and Recreation is evolving and we will ultimately have a little more autonomy to run the garden um, than we do now. We'll be rolling out new membership um, structure in the next couple of months. And if people want to become a member, they can sign up online at um, the leechbotanicalgarden.org website. And finally, I wanted to call attention to the fact that the garden is very concerned about um, how people are being treated in our community and especially the Asian owned business community. And we've started to reach out to some of those business communities um, by way of marketing some goodwill, taking flowers from the garden in arrangements to local businesses. But a letter will be going out in our next newsletter asking um, Leech Garden members and even visitors to ally with staff to be uh, part of the team of welcoming people and helping anybody they notice might need some help and can contact a staff person or do their best to help the person that might be struggling with uh, directions or where to find facilities as may be needed. So we're trying to be active, not just um, full of platitudes about how terrible things are happening to Asian Americans. And that's it. Thank you, Mary. We look forward to seeing that um, coming out in the newsletter. Any questions? All right. I'm going to do a quick school update. You may not know if you don't have a kid in the, in the Portland public school system that hybrid learning began on March 29th. And this week they're doing all asynchronous 
with some kids going back and next week begins the full in-person. There will be two sessions at our neighborhood schools of Woodmere and Whitman. Lane is not going back that I know of, or at least not um, to the same degree. There's a morning session of eight to 10 and an afternoon session of, I believe it's 12.30 to 2.30. And so be aware of that extra traffic around our schools. And you will be pleasantly surprised to discover that speed bumps have ha appeared on Duke to help with said traffic problems. So um, if you need to know more about the school stuff and the limited in-person instruction, you can go to pps.net. Maria put it in the chat. And then that also updates. Oh, Eli, do you have a question on that? Uh, no, I just wanted to um, tack on um, some school reopening information, but go ahead and finish up. Uh, my next is part is on nutrition. Would it go better before that? Uh, yeah, I was just going to say Senator Jama and Representative Reardon are having a education town hall on Monday with school reopening updates from the Oregon Department of Education uh, and with representatives from North Clackamas and David Douglas school districts as well. So if folks uh, want to hear more about those kinds of things and the legislators education policies that'll be on Monday. Would you put information on how to get a sure look will. at that please? Thank you. Laura Lee, you have a question? Did you say that Lane is not going high, is not participating in hybrid? Is that what you said? I, I might have misheard you. As far as I can tell, they're not because of the way their nutrition site is working. If there are students there, I suspect they would be um, accessed and not Lane. Because um, let me show you the, the nutrition schedule. So schools that are getting, schools where kids are going back to limited in person are serving meals uh, at their at the end of each of their sessions and um, schools that are not getting limited in-person instruction are sites for distribution for everybody else so if you're going in person you get your food your food on site at school to take home if you're not going in person you go to one of these other sites in our neighborhood, the only site, if you're not doing limited in person, is Lane. So that does pose a barrier for our neighbors who were formerly getting it at Woodmere and Whitman and don't have transportation to get the 20 blocks over to Lane. So that's something to point out. Uh, but there are, uh, according to PPS, food pantries at all of the schools now, and you can see the hours there. Any questions? Okay. I also want to bring up that next month is our board elections. Woo! Um, if you like what we do and you want to be part of the decisions or um, lead anything, you are welcome to come and join us. And uh, our elections are next month. They'll be during the same meeting. They'll be kind of towards the beginning. And um, We'll post more on our website about it, but there's four officers up for election. There's chair, that's what I'm doing, vice chair, that's what Shannon does. You've got treasurer, that's what Lynn's currently doing, and secretary, what Laura Lee is currently doing. Other board members at large can choose to lead projects or uh, be part of committees. So the time commitment is kind of up to you uh, with a minimum expectation of coming to meetings and participating in like email discussions and things like that. So if you have more questions, let us know. Um, you can also message me or any of the other board members and there will be more about how to join the board up on our website in the coming weeks. Any well, there's questions? no band practice, so I'll be there <laughs> for once. All right. Um, I also want to mention that we have a new time for our all committees meeting. That is when everything except for land use meets. And we are now going to hold that at 6 p.m. to accommodate schedules with different shifting in time. And it's only going to be an hour since we seem to be pretty efficient these days. That is a relaxed meeting. It's not nearly as formal as this one. It's where we kind of hash out what's happening with projects. 
And now I am very excited to let Lisa do some talking about the various projects uh, in Brentwood Darlington that she's going to bring up to us. So take it away, Lisa. Hi, great. Thank you so much. Um, I didn't prepare a presentation, but I do have some um, graphics that I can share either. Um, I don't know if I can share my screen or maybe potentially share in the chat or after as well. Uh, let me make you a co-host real fast um, and then you will be able to share your screen. So go ahead and start and you'll see a pop. Okay, great. So, um, so yeah, so I am the project manager for Brentwood Darlington Multimodal Improvements Project. And the project is a federally funded project that's being administered through ODOT. And so PBOT applied for this funding through Metro. So lots of agencies at play that's part of this project. Um, and so I started with the city um, about a year and a half ago. And this was actually one of the first projects that I was assigned and was able to start. So the project limits are from 52nd to 82nd along Duke and Flavel. And along Duke and Flavel will be infilling sidewalk where there's missing gaps of sidewalk and upgrading uh, or adding the ADA curb ramps. We'll also be adding crossings at, um, at several locations along Duke and Flavel. And then we will be doing bike greenway improvements along Nap Ogden, which is um, from 52nd through 87th. And so at 82nd, Ogden and Nap um, jog, and that's where the greenway jogs. And so at Southeast Nap and 82nd, we'll be adding a signal and that'll help pedestrians cross 82nd as well. And so part of the greenway improvements at 72nd in Ogden also will have some medians um, for crossing and other improvements will be along the greenway will be, we'll look at stop sign orientation and then addition of speed bumps. So I can share now. Yeah, okay, great. Let me go ahead. Um, all of this stuff is available online, um, except for one graphic, which I am about to show. But um, let's see here. I'm going to just share my Okay. So this is the project website. And um, I can share this link afterwards as well, but here's the general information. Right now we are in early design, so we're at 30% design and it'll go through a 60%, a 95%, and then a final design before it gets submitted for um, contracting for construction. And construction is expected to happen in late 2022. So um, there's a little bit of the components this map actually is the map showing where we're proposing crosswalks. Um, it is a little hard to see. I can um, share the full size image PDF as well, but the proposed crosswalks that we'll be adding with um, our project is in the light blue color. So there's some, some crosswalks that are already existing and then some crosswalks that are being added by other projects. And then the, these turquoise colored uh, crossings are the crossings we'll be adding. Here's the greenway that I mentioned um, with specific intersection improvements at 82nd. This is where the signal will be at NAP and 82nd. At 72nd, uh, we won't be making any signal modifications, but we will be adding some medians. And then at 52nd and NAP. And that's the one where I can bring up an image to show you this is, you know, very draft stages, but just to show you an idea of what we're thinking, here's Ogden here, this is 52nd, and then here's Knapp. We will be infilling sidewalk from Knapp to Ogden on the west side of 52nd, and then we'll be adding some striping to sh help navigate um, some of the bikes, and then also potentially add some medians for um, protection and, and then also just a shorter crosswalk. Crossings. So this is the um, you know draft concept right now. Like I said, we're at thirty percent. So this is likely to be 
changed, but definitely refined. Um, but this is the idea where we're trying to channelize bikes and allow them to have access across, as well as um, you know, high visible, protected with median um, crossings. So um, let's see here. And then this is the map with crossings that I can also share with you, where you can kind of zoom in and see if um, you know what the legend and the different crossings are. Uh, that's really all I have to share right now. Is there any specific questions? Uh, if you have a question for Lisa, you can raise your electronic hand or your physical hand and I'll try to see you. Uh, looks like Machu, you have a question, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. These are exciting developments. Thank you for uh, sharing the update. Um, I guess like in your role as capital project manager, mm -hmm. do you speak of a recent example, perhaps in the past year where separate adopted plans were consolidated in the uh, request for proposals. Uh, so that way, like, separate plans could be advanced with one um, RFP. Uh, and I guess it's kind of a general question leading into how does PBOT coordinate between multiple plans that mm -hmm. apply to a specific location? How do they coordinate? Mm -hmm. Sure. So um, once a project comes to the capital delivery division, which is the, the division that I work within in the capital, capital projects. That means it's been scoped, meaning there's, you know, we know what we're going to be building and where. So like what improvements and where we're gonna be building them and we have funding secured. And so in the early, in planning stages, and I think um, some of you may know my colleague, Zeph Wagner and Brian Poole, there's some, they're planners at, um, in the projects planning and um, policy group. They're, they're the ones that are working on plans and trying and then identifying areas throughout the entire community. And so they'll work with the community and with um, the Bureau to identify, prioritize, make sure that they're capturing those in the plans. And then once they get to capital improvement or capital projects, there, we're still in contact with Zeph. So, you know, Zeph and I have still, you know, been communicating and especially because there is, um, I don't know if you all have heard the Southeast Lower, Lower Southeast Rising Development Plan that they're working on. And so we're working even closer projects that are in capital projects now. That way, you know, if there is something that we can coordinate with and, and it overlaps with our projects, we're able to, as much as we can, incorporate them, or at the very least, make sure we're not building something that we know will be rebuilt or improved or changed at a later date. And so just the coordination, making sure that we are, um, one, making sure we're continuing to deliver the, the needs and the priorities that the community has, that they want, but also, you know, for future coordination. And so, um, I don't, did that help answer the question? Or is there something more that I could? Uh, it, it did, so thank you very much, Lisa. Um, I guess I was thinking about some recent examples in the community, um, specifically on 46th Avenue, uh, a block south of Tolman, there was a safe route to school crossing, um, but one block north was a Portland bicycle master plan crossing. And so I was just thinking about like, what opportunities there are to advance two goals when mm -hmm. you have funds and uh, you spoke to that. So I really appreciate that. Yeah, and it's interesting. I'll, I'll just mention as, like you said, in a specific example, just yesterday, um, I met with Zeph and Brian um, and then there were three or four other project managers that all have current projects that are in the Brentman Darlington area so that we could all discuss, discuss all of our projects in detail um, and then where they do overlap, make sure that we're coordinating and that it, it makes sense for everyone's projects. And so one example I can give is the 70s Greenway and the 60s Greenway. Those will be running north south and intersecting through this project. And we're, you know, making sure we're very clear that the crossings that they are putting in are, are aligning with the projects and the curves and the sidewalks that we're putting in were our projects. So the 70s Greenway will actually be constructed before our project and the 60s Greenway is gonna be constructed after our project. And so, you know, it was really nice to sit down and overlap the plans and intersections and see like, okay, well, 
you know, the 70s, you guys are doing these intersections. We can make sure our spacings work with those spacings. And then where we're adding crosswalks for the Burtman Darlington improvement projects at Duke and Flobel, um, seeing how 70s green or the 60s greenway can align with those as well. So that we're not duplicating our one block off of intersections that we're improving. Um, so yeah, so we're, we do try to coordinate. Obviously we can't all the time. The Safe for Us to School projects is probably one of the hardest programs to coordinate with because they're so small and so fast and usually they're just paint and post and they, um, you know, they're very targeted, very specific scoping of um, access to schools. But it, with that said, we are coordinating with Safe for Us to School too. So I'm working with Abra and um, Janice, making sure that they're aware of the intersections we're improving. We're aware of the intersections that they've identified. And so you'll see on their maps also that shows like crossings, by other projects and so our crossings that we're improving are you know shown on their maps and vice versa cool thank you appreciate it very much good question uh i see stephanie has her hand up uh, yes thank you chelsea lisa thank you very much for um coming to speak to us tonight uh, i have several questions um uh, one to build on matthew's question and your comment about um, the safe routes to school project, the island, the um, the crossing built at 52nd and uh, the northern, more northerly portion of Knapp was, um, I guess, one of those real fast overnight, put it in place and move on safe routes to school project and. Um, Apparently it's meant to be a pedestrian crossing, mm -hmm. but because of its relationship with NAP and the fact that NAP has been advertised as the future greenway and it has been equipped with all the slow street equipment, cyclists are cycling on NAP because that's what Peabot wants them to do. And then they are trying to use the pedestrian crossing as a bicycle crossing. Mm -hmm which works if you're going west, but if you come back east, then you end up crossing and then riding north, I mean, south against traffic. Cars mm -hmm. parked there. I saw a gigantic truck parked there that, would, that um, used up not only the parking space, but also part of the bike lane. So mm -hmm. that anybody trying to follow all the signals that Peabot has laid out there is going to be riding right into traffic. And we mm -hmm. have asked Zeph and, um, and you and Scott Cohen to do something mm -hmm. to make this safe. And if you're not going to be um, doing the infill or the construction until late 2022 and school is beginning next week, we have a, a problem here because mm -hmm. People are using the greenway as the future greenway as a present greenway because of the slow streets um, equipment mm -hmm. and because of all the advertising that's been done. Mm -hmm. And um, we think that you can do several things. You can re make it illegal to park there, to remove the okay parking sign and then put in, bolt in some wa those wands that mm -hmm. are used to um, separate <clears throat> bike lanes from um, car lanes and they're removable but they can if you put them along the outer edge mm -hmm. of the bicycle lane on the on the traffic side of the bicycle lane then it will um, it will be a sort of a, a better it will offer um, a wall to, so to speak between the cyclists and the um, and the motorists. And I don't think that would cost very much mm -hmm. to remove so, the, the sign and then put up some ones. Yes. And um, and so Zeph, Scott and I did actually discuss that and we submitted that to our traffic investigations group and they are the group that will review that. If there are safety concerns, they, um, they will be the ones that can respond the quickest, but they will do their analysis. And so, um, from that, they may suggest, and like you said, parking removal and some wands would be some, um, would be fairly inexpensive and something we could install quickly, but they'll have to review that for 
um, making sure that it meets the specific design standards because we don't want to put it in something that's not safe. And so that has been forwarded on to traffic investigation. They're reviewing that. They'll do an analysis. And then um, if it makes sense, they can, they may, they'll be able to propose specific design and um, implementation of those improvements. How long will that take? Usually, you know, they're actually fairly responsive. Um, it is, it's called 823 SAFE. I don't know if you're all familiar with it, but it's um, an online form that you can actually complete that um, is meant for citizens and, and community members to report dangerous or maintenance or, um, situations. And um, if it is a safety concern, it jumps to the top of the queue and they'll review it and um, you know make sure that something's it is addressed quickly. So but how about this particular, aside, aside from people generally reporting things on 823 SAFE, which I have to tell you is not resp a responsive um, uh, phone number, but what about this specific thing? I'm very worried about people who are, I see cycling south against mm -hmm. traffic in that bike lane. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I, uh, I can follow up on the request as well, and I can copy you. They, you know, I, the traffic investigations group is a group of three, four engineers in our traffic group at, at PBOT, and they, you know, they report directly to the city traffic engineer, Wendy Cauley, and, um, and she does review those and she is, you know, if there is a safety concern, she'll make sure that it gets addressed promptly, so. Well, would you please push that? Because, sure, I will. Uh, I know Zeph forwarded it on to traffic investigations. I'll follow up to see if um, they've been had a chance to review it. Okay, thank you. And then um, a second question I have is that several months ago, I contacted you and asked if you could please consider putting the, the, green, the greenway through Brentwood Park and never having it on NAP for several mm -hmm. reasons. And, um, and you said, yes, you would be very happy to consider that. And then, of course, that didn't happen. And so well, I'm- We're still very early in the design, as I mentioned. The Greenway um, actually has been, um, a lot has alignment has been put out and it's actually under review right now. The traffic team is reviewing it. Um, and the routing the greenways, and I, I'm pretty sure Scott and Zeph would agree with me or maybe has said something similar, through parks is actually not um, typically what we prefer. We do like to keep them on neighborhood streets. And so um, it, we have not, like we have done it successfully in the past. It's just Typically, they're, you know, the parks do not, they prefer not to have bikes riding through their park spaces. Okay, but then you uh, could route, route the thing down, down to Knapp and then back up to, um, to Ogden in front of Lane Middle School. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then go out on, go mm -hmm. west on Ogden. Mm -hmm. And Ogden does not dogleg anywhere. So you get a straight crossing at 52nd. And then as you proceed through to 45th, you come out further away from the edge of the uplift. Mm -hmm. So unfortunately, our, my project ends at 52nd. And so this will be something that I'll need to continue to coordinate with Scott and Zeph because, you know, as I mentioned before, our, our project goes to 52nd. And beyond that, I, I really have to coordinate with Scott Cohen, who does the Greenway Improvements and Planning, at, and Zeph, who was has the wider regional planning lens for that project. So, you know, I'll take the Greenway through 52nd. And, you know, that routing, that is something that we can look at and it may make sense. Um, and like I said, if, I need if you to would, entertain. If you would please seriously consider it because wherever the Greenway comes out at 52nd, then, then um, the other planners are trapped into that for the future, right? Mm -hmm. Well, and, and, you know, we did speak with, I did um, talk to Scott and Zeph about this, and they are in agreement that from 52nd West would make more, like the Ogden does make sense. It's just figuring out how, where to route it up to Ogden. Okay. So I'll continue to have those conversations as well for the Greenway. 
Okay, well, I appreciate hearing that because I, I, I think it is um, um, worth, worth doing. And from mm -hmm. our point of view, I think it, it's safer in many ways and it's gonna make crossing 52nd way easier. I mean, you, you've got such elaborate um, solutions now for dealing with the, the dog leg of NAP mm -hmm. uh, at 52nd that wouldn't be necessary at, um, at Ogden. And also um, bringing, the, bringing the Greenway back up to Lane Middle School on, on 60th helps students too going to and from the school. So um, mm -hmm. I, think, I think it could be uh, a, you know, a, a great benefit from all angles. So I'm, I'm glad to hear that you're considering it. Um, and, um, but then we also have to still, even if the Greenway goes out on Ogden um, to, um, to 52nd, Mm -hmm. There's still the problem remaining at Knapp with that, that crossing that people misinterpret as, um, I mean, they can't help it. It's completely logical right now that they think of it as a place where you cross with bicycles. Mm -hmm. But it's meant, according to Zeph, mm -hmm. who got seen a, quite, well, maybe a little irritated or angry that people were trying to bike there, but only, but all the signals are, yeah, this is for a bicycle because this is where the greenway is gonna be. That's why it's a slow street now. But if the, the greenway were altered and it went out on Ogden, we still have to do something about safety at, um, at 52nd and Nap because I think people will still try to, um, to cross there with their bicycles. Maybe, so I don't know, but, what you will do, but um, in any case, um, thank you for considering changing the route. I appreciate that very much. And, and, um, and then one final comment um, about the funding sources. Um, actually, um, it was the, the BDNA and our own chair, Chelsea Powers, who, um, who, who appealed to Metro and received the flexible funding grant. So I wanna make sure that, um, that she and the other BDNA people get total credit for that. Mm -hmm. And then this BBOT was very generous to contribute funding of its own so that we came out with, a, um, you know, it was over $5 million and we're really, really grateful for that. Um, but I just wanted to make sure that um, so people who may be new to our, our meeting or our neighborhood association know that, know what Chelsea, and the others did. So thank Great. you. Thank you so much. Yes, I did yeah. wonderful things about the support this project had from the community. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, again, thank you very much. Shout out though, to Gail and Derek who were on the board at that time and also helped with that project in the background. Thank you, Gail and Derek. Oh, okay. And thank you again, Lisa. All right, do we have any more questions for Lisa? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. I agree with Stephanie a million percent. The bikeway should go back down Ogden um, because it would help the kids a lot. You're going down Ogden from 82nd towards Lane and then the jog on Nap isn't that big of a deal, but going back to Ogden would make a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I 52nd too. Yes, yeah. I actually used to live at 47th and Nap, and so yeah. I'm very familiar with those um, and would bike to, I worked in um, industrial Southeast at the time. So I, yes, I do recognize the hill there and the site issues at Nap um, in 45th and knowing that Ogden, like you had said, gives you additional block where um, vehicles can see pedestrians mm -hmm. biking better. And, like what an opposite. I love the Greenway down Ogden. <laughs> Just, yeah. I, I do. <laughs> Any other questions for Lisa? All right, I'm going to sneak mine in then. Um, Lisa, I have a question about the, um, and this may not be your your realm of projects, but the barriers mm -hmm. that are on 
the current um, Ogden Knapp Greenway and the other slow streets um, mm -hmm. signage. Is that <clears throat> intended to be permanent or is that a temporary solution until something better can be put in? Because mm -hmm. right now they're proving to be uh, a hazard and a nuisance to mm -hmm. both drivers and homeowners. Um, neighbors who live uh, near them are constantly having to put them back up or move them back around. And some of our more narrow streets, it is nearly impossible to turn around them without hitting them. And you end up having to do like the wide trailer swing and mm -hmm. go and basically veer into oncoming traffic to avoid hitting the barrier, even though it's still in the middle of the street. The street's just not wide enough to accommodate an A-frame, a giant cone, and an A-frame, mm -hmm. and two lanes of traffic. So mm -hmm. hopefully that's my whole question. <laughs> yeah, no, I appreciate that. Um, they are temporary signage. It's, you know, was rolled out as part of the pandemic and um, allowing more, you know, space for people walking and biking. Um, Scott Cohen actually is also would be the point contact for that. So he is the one that has been um, kind of identifying locations. And there is some, there are some locations that are going to be more permanent. And I believe on our website, there is um, more information about the program and how it's moving forward. Um, and then when the temporary signage would potentially be removed. And there's actually also locations that um, potentially could still be coming, future locations that they'll be adding. And so it is a little bit of a moving target and program. And I know, uh, like I said, Scott is kind of leading that program for the slow street signage. So he would be the best contact. I'll, I, I took a note to follow up with him and I'll try to find the information on our website too, that, so you can kind of see the plan. I, I'm pretty sure it lays out, you know, what to expect in the future, when things are changing, how long they'll be out, um, those kind of um, questions that you, seem, that you seem to also have. Thank you, because some of them are fine and some of them the streets just, they're just so skinny, it just doesn't mm -hmm. quite work and even the little compacts are having trouble. Yes. <laughs> All right, any further questions before we let Lisa go for the evening? All right, I wanna thank Lisa for being here and taking time out of her night um, to come and present to us. And we'll go ahead and take our break a little early, but I do wanna give you a teaser that in the second half, we're gonna be talking about uh, land use and transportation, including a 30 day snapshot of real estate in our neighborhood. And we're going to be talking about SOCIC weeks that are coming up in July. So if you are interested in trees, real estate, land use, stick around. And uh, if not, this will be up on YouTube in a couple of days. So you can always catch what you missed. And we're going to take a five minute break now. And we will be back at 7.55 to restart with our second half. Lisa, thank you again for coming to talk. And I went ahead and put that link for the multimodal improvements in the chat. All right, everybody, bye yeah. break. Okay, thank you, Lisa. All right. Go ahead, Lynn, and let's start the treasurer's report. Okay, um, so we started off with the checking account with about $7,500 and savings a thousand. Um, in the month, we had just a couple of purchases. Um, we did another round of gift cards from Grocery Outlet for our neighbors' uh, COVID support that we uh, started last year. And we also did a thousand brochures for $288. So we ended up with a checking account of about $6,700 um, and then savings thousand. So we come out to $7,700. And we will be getting a reimbursement, or not a reimbursement, but Southeast Uplift is going to be giving us our communications funds allowance um, up front this year. And then we spend it and then we submit the receipts at the end of the year. So we'll be getting $500 probably in the next week or so. 
So that's it. Any question? I want to thank Lynn for being an awesome treasurer and for keeping this up. Thank and um, we'll be well on our way, I think, to spending that communication funds allowance with our brochures and things. So yeah, yeah. So we can get that taken care of before the end of the year. All right. Um, we'll go ahead and move on to land use and transportation. So Stephanie, take it away. Okay, so um, we've got several topics to review here. We'll see how the time goes. Um, I'd like to start with the Soak It Week uh, and tree watering uh, presentation that Laura Lee uh, has, pre has prepared. Um, for those uh, of you attending the meeting, uh, Laura Lee Cole has been working very hard with another uh, wonderful resident here in Brentwood Darlington to try to preserve trees here, well, in the city of Portland, but especially because it's for it's uh, our neighborhood here in Brentwood, Darlington. Uh, so I'd like uh, Laura Lee to describe a project that she and Kim Hill are working on, which is called Soak It Week. And Laura Lee, would you like to explain to everybody what Soak It Week is? Sure, thanks, Stephanie. Um, so Soak It Week, um, our summers here in Portland have been becoming increasingly drier and drier. And so a lot of the trees, um, especially the younger trees, uh, they need extra watering. And um, Trees for Life came up with this, um, I don't know when they came up with it, a couple of years ago starting, um, this, this project called Soak It Week. And what they do is they designate the last week of July and the last week of August as Soak It Week and they hand out these buckets um, and the buckets have three holes drilled in them and there's instructions placed in when they give you your bucket there's instructions placed in the bucket on um, how much water uh, your trees need depending on the age how often you have to water them and um, Kim and I reached out to Trees for Life and asked them if uh, they can include Brentwood Darlington, um, and and we would we would do a soak it week for our neighborhood, and we found out last Sunday that um, the um, they were approved for a grant from the city, and they're um, excited to collaborate with Brentwood Darlington, and they're going to give us two hundred buckets to distribute to our neighbors. Um, you can see a picture there. That's Jim with his arms raised up in the air in that picture. Um, and that's at his event. Um, they, he's done this quite a few times. Um, and he invited uh, Kim Hill and I to attend his May 22nd Soak It Week event so that we can learn how, how to actually reach out to the neighborhood and, um, and explain to them what these buckets are for and when we'll be distributing them. Um, Kim and I came up with this time last weekend um, were the tentative event suggestions and dates, um, we were basing that around the May 22nd demonstration and training with Jim. And when we emailed back and forth with him, we're kind of under the impression that that's when he's gonna give us our buckets um, when we show up on May 22nd. However, I think if we contact him at, ahead of time, we'll, we can get the buckets a little sooner. He does have a volunteer who is going to drill these holes. So we kind of have to work around his schedule too on when he's gonna get the drilling done. Um, but we are planning on going to the May 22nd demonstration. And so we were planning, we were trying to think of some Saturdays after that demonstration. Um, we started thinking that we might do it on 60th Avenue, but um, uh, I've talked to Chelsea and Stephanie and we're, kind, we're, we're not sure about where we're gonna actually distribute the buckets right now. So that's kind of open for discussion if anybody has any ideas. Um, so yeah, and then we also, uh, Kim reached out to the Rose Lentz uh, CDC Youth Initiative Program um, to hire some, um, hire a couple of, of youth uh, to help us with the buckets. And um, she's kind of more the expert on that. Um, 
but we we would we would uh, basically hire and pay two teens um, to uh, help us with the stickers and the distribution of the buckets, um, and they would in turn gain experience, work experience, uh, volunteer. Well, it's not really going to be volunteers; we work experience that they can use on college applications and resumes for future employment. Um, so that's kind of like an, an overview. Um, definitely will welcome any questions anybody has or open to discussion. Anybody have questions or thoughts, ideas? Uh, Stephanie, go ahead. Okay, thank you very much uh, for that nice presentation, Laura Lee. Um, you know, we, Justin and I were just thinking that you might want to have one big event on so, 60th right outside the Learning Garden Lab. And um, so since this, this uh, slideshow was made, Laura Lee and I have talked and Kim's emailed and we've all kind of uh, ruminated. So I oh, okay. think that one big event is a good idea, but also Laura Lee and Kim had the ideas of, um, you can see here the setup is really minimal and they have spaces uh, that would be conducive to this at their homes, as well as uh, we had, Laura Lee and I had the additional idea earlier today of we could use other opportunities like the pop-up pantries and things like that to distribute as well. So, um, <laughs> And, and the I, LTL plant sales that sounded ideal. So the thing with that is that we may not get the buckets before that. Is that correct, Laura Lee? Yeah, we're going to reach out to Jim soon and ask him. Um, I, I don't want to, to pressure them to start drilling those holes like right now, but uh, yeah. we, I, we're going to reach out to him and let him know about the plant sale and ask him if uh, Kim and I can come pick up some buckets beforehand. I think he was planning the handover on May 22nd. But if they're ready before that, um, I'm sure he'll be more than happy um, to, to give them to us. Um, I also wanted to make a comment about uh, the smaller events. Um, from what I, from speaking with Jim or emailing back and forth and talking to Kim, it seems like uh, it is hard to, 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 to get rid of or pass out, not get rid of, but distribute 200 <laughs> buckets at one event, it's going to be, um, I don't know if he's been successful at that, um, from my understanding. He's been more successful at um, keeping it going, have, have a few events, uh, see how many buckets can be distributed, see how many he has left, then come up with some more um, through social media or flyers, uh, some more opportunities and just just keep trying to get the buckets out to the residents before the last week of July and the last week of August when the actual soak it weeks will happen. Um, that's my understanding. Uh, can I make a suggestion based on that um, that new information that we have about the distribution that we not pressure to get them um, for the LGL plant sales if they're not ready, we can have information to distribute that Soak It Week is coming and we can have people sign up for our newsletter with that um, category, um, which we can do internally. And we can send them emails specifically to those people interested in Soak It Week of buckets are going to be available these dates, these locations, and then we can follow that up with in July and August. Hey, it's soak it week. Remember to fill your bucket and put it by your trees. So we can kind of um, start with getting people's email and end by reminding them so that the event contact doesn't fall off after they receive their bucket. Because I know I will probably get a bucket and then a month later I'll go, now why did I have this bucket with holes in it? So, um, Maria, or you completely obsessive like I am with my buckets over the last three years, and I'm I my neighbors just see me moving my buckets all around all summer long. I I love my buckets. So, um, but I think that that's a great suggestion. Um, I may, uh, yeah, that would be fantastic, and then we can send out reminders. Um, and they do have, like I said, they do uh, included in the grant are the buckets, the stickers and also a postcard that is placed in the bucket in 
uh, we, we told Jim what our preferred languages would be for the instructions on Soak It Week. So, um, and I, I think, I'm not sure if he's gotten back to Kim on that, but I, I, I have a feeling that he has. Um, so I'll, I'll check with her. Excellent. Maria, you have a question. Uh, yeah, I just had another idea. I don't know if um, Linda is still from the Master Gardeners is still with us in the meeting, but I was just thinking sometimes the Master Gardeners have these super cool um, information booths and they're like, ask a Master Gardener, you know, and you can just come with your little plant that you have a question about or just this one plant that you're describing a problem with. And these are very popular um, events, I think, that the Master Gardeners organize. I know they have sometimes the um, volunteers doing those at the zoo pre-COVID. And um, yeah, I was just thinking maybe that is something, if it is hard to get 200 buckets distributed, um, you know, to get people interested in popping by and talking to a Master Gardener and, learn, you know, doing it all in one, in one event together. Yeah, that's a great idea. And like, I'm happy to be a, uh, Kim has volunteered to store the buckets at her house. And I'm also happy to be a contact because I do have a side yard that's rather large. Um, and I'll be more than happy to, to have people swing by and pick up buckets from my location as well. Um, Kim also had an idea that she wanted me to present to the board um, that if any of the board members want to take um, you know, five to 10 buckets yourself, if you know neighbors um, that are gardeners that you think would benefit from it, um, then we, we actually will start, because I know that I have a lot of seniors on my street and they are, they are out in their gardens and planting fruit trees all the time. And I would love to just walk up to them with a bucket and say, hey, <laughs> look what we have for our neighborhood. <laughs> and so that was Kim's suggestion was if any, if any of the board members would like to take five or 10 buckets to start, that actually reduces the amount that we'll, we'll be handing out to the community as well. If we end up doing that, we should include um, brochures and other things like that in their buckets. Yeah. Um, and uh, we could we could have a little wagon and put a BDNA sign on it. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have further questions or comments on this? Uh, let's see. I I had um, yeah a couple of questions, please. That um, just to say that first of all, we we think this is a wonderful event and we want to support it. If you want. If you end up wanting to do an on-street thing, you know, let me know. I will apply for the permits with Peabot um, if if, um, if if we need them. Um, and um, if you need help with um, formatting and printing the flyers, if somehow it's not going to, if if Jim is not able to do it, I'll, then we are glad to help with that. Okay. And, um, uh, so you just have to let us know what you need, okay? And um, uh, I also will call the B to see what is the cost of putting an insert. Uh, you can B. see my email, Stephanie. Uh, the last time we put an insert in the B, it was $180 for 4,000 inserts over the 97206 zip code. For 4,000? Yes. But who, print it, who prints uh, them? So we printed them. That does not include the printing cost. And I think the printing cost was a, a few hundred dollars, but Lynn would be able to look that up. The last time we did that, I believe was 2018 or 2019. Was that for the recite the electronic it was recycling? The so whatever the last year we did for the cleanup was, mm -hmm. um, would be in our treasurer's report around May. Okay. Or somewhat before. And, but, um, Usually and I think we have to budget around five to seven hundred dollars for that advertising. I see. Okay. Well that that might be a deterrent, but you know, we can see. Um then I got information from Erco about their, their translation bank, what they charge and so on. And they offer three hundred languages um, to choose from. And their turnaround time is very is is quite fast. It looks like three to five days. So if we need if we ever need them like now <laughs> with this project, I mean, we could call on them for um, Mandarin, for example, and Vietnamese if, um, if need be. My son can do the Mandarin. Oh, that's awesome. Fabulous. Okay. Yeah, he's, a he's a Chinese major and he's actually gonna be studying in Taiwan soon. So 
I'm volunteering my son for the Mandarin translation. Oh, outstanding. Then we just need the Vietnamese. Yeah, okay. So why don't we plan tentatively to have our own Soak It Week flyer to hand out regardless of whether or not we have buckets that kind of outlines what the program is going to be and the timeline and um, gets people signed up for more information. And that way we can start from there. Sounds great. Oh, yeah, Chelsea, could yeah, that be, yeah, could that be in the shape of like an insert? That we could you also put my in mind. Yeah. I think it should definitely, I think a third sheet insert that you could put in the brochures would be a great idea. Yeah, something on cardstock. Yeah. You got it. Your wish. You'll mm -hmm. get it. <laughs> okay. Well, that, that sounds that sounds very good. And um, okay, well, just let us know how we can help um, Laura Lee and Kim. Uh, the um the last thing um we had talked about um, a preliminary approval for $600 for the two youth workers. Um, I didn't know, did we want to address that today, Chelsea? It looked like um, in one of the emails that, or I can't remember if his email or on the phone that we talked, uh, that there might be some assistance from Rose for that cost. Okay. And, so and I know that Kim pl is planning on um, talking with Rose. It, it, they're, they're, they train their youth and they have to go through the training before they're able to go out into the community and work and be paid. And I know their training doesn't end until June 5th, which um, is a little bit later than we had imagined. We were, we were hoping that they would be able to go to the training on, on uh, May 22nd with us. And so I think uh, Kim is actually in the process of communicating with Rose to work out a timeline to see if, if, our, if it's even gonna work for us in this project. We're hoping that it does, but um, that's still kind of an ongoing uh, conversation. So where do the, the, these kids live? Do they live in various neighborhoods? Do some of them live in Brentwood Darlington? Uh, you know, I don't know the answer to that. Um, uh -huh. I'll have to ask uh, Kim and um, I know that they, I know that they've actually worked at the, um, the the Learning Gardens Lab, um, a lot of different places around town, but uh, it's a good question. I can ask her that. I know it's called the Lentz Initiative, but I'm not sure if they're all from Lentz. Uh -huh. I know they do use at least some local kids because uh, an adult neighbor of mine was in the program as a child or mm -hmm. as a teen living here in the neighborhood. So it's at least Lentz and surrounding areas, if nothing else. But let's... Um, Let's hold off on making any votes or motions or anything on that financially until we have the details of that, because we still have another meeting before we're even, we have a couple of meetings before we're even close to this. And we could always decide to do um, small events, small distribution events leading up to, and then in July having one big event where we get a permit, maybe we have a master gardener on hand, maybe um, Learning Gardens Lab is there to, tell about their program and we do like a July kickoff instead and bring in those youth to distribute. That sounds great. So it's um, we might want to shift from big push in the beginning to a bigger push at the end and make it into a, a party and by then a lot of us will be vaccinated and so we'll have um, some more volunteers available. So well, also Chelsea by, by July, we're going to start having sunny days and people will be more receptive to the idea, I mean, the, so uh, of watering the trees. Yard out uh, in the back of the community center or things like that. So we've got some options when we get to better weather. So let's keep um, with this uh, plan to start getting people information and getting their information so we can contact them while well, you get the training you need to run these events, and then we'll work through the other questions as we get to it. And I see Shannon in the chat says that Wild Grown Farm would love to participate in something like that. So Yay. maybe we can uh, just have some sort of um, Green Brentwood Arlington event that features the Soak It Week buckets, but has other things to lure people in to get their buckets. Okay, that sounds wonderful. Okay. Awesome. Yeah, so 
Uh, one more thumbs up to Lorley and Kim for their work on this. I know Kim's not here, but I want to make sure she gets credit too, because they've been putting in a lot of effort here. So Kim and I are so excited that, and, and Stephanie's been putting in work too, all of us. And we're just so excited that, um, that they got the grant and that they were um, happy to collaborate uh, trees for life we're happy to co collaborate with Brentwood Darlington we're just we're thrilled and I think it's going to be a lot of fun these buckets I, I think so too I think it's just a perfect beautiful kind of event or series of eventlets to have but your discovery of trees for life Oregon yours and Kim's discovery was just critical I had never heard of them and um, it's a wonderful organization so all that credit for your research you know, goes all to you. So thank you so much. I wanna um, clarify the point we were asking about earlier with the inserts for the bee. Lynn went and found the information. Thank you, Lynn, you're amazing. In 2019, we paid $180 to the bee. That was the insert fee. And it cost us 400 to print. So it was $580 for the whole thing. Okay, that, yeah, that might be a bit pricey. If but we so. are supporting a local business that we normally advertise with once a month um, or once a year. And the reason the printing cost on that was higher, I believe was we either had colored paper or color, but it was 4,000 inserts. So it's it's a lot. That is, uh, yeah, boy. But we, we could do some things to cut the costs on that that we can talk about more at the all committees meetings, but... It's definitely still a, uh, in the realm of possibility. Oh, okay, there good. Because it would be a really cool thing to do. No. Yeah. So let's talk about that more as we get closer and we know um, more what we're going to advertise, because that would be something we'd probably want to do closer to um, June. Okay. So. All right. All right. Super. Anything else for Soak It Week? All right, I'm gonna bump back to the land use slide and Stephanie, go ahead with the rest of your report. And then Derek, you get to talk about real estate. Right. Okay, very fine. Uh, all right, so I, I will start with um, describing uh, some, some of the information that I received uh, when I talked to the executive director of Impact Northwest um, about the Brentwood Darlington Community Center. And um, he, he informed us that Multnomah County owns the building, but not the land that the building is on, which is an unusual <laughs> arrangement. And the reason that we think that the county ended up owning this is because the county originally loaned a lot of money to the nonprofit that built the community center. But then the nonprofit was not able to pay it back. And, um, and that was probably the understanding all along anyway. And so then the Multnomah took possession of the building. But um, it, it um, so I mean, so that's why the, the county is the owner and it leases the land from Portland Public Schools. It's a, a lease that will be ending in 2035. I presume it will be renewed. I don't know the exact boundaries uh, that, are in, that are included in that lease, but, we, but we'll find that out um, eventually. So something else interesting I learned is that Impact Northwest is allowed the use of the building rent-free in return for being responsible for uh, maintaining it, making repairs um, uh, and, and paying for insurance coverage there. And it operates the building, it rents out space. And, um, and I believe that, that Impact Northwest uh, has a, a child uh, development program there. Is that right, Chelsea? Okay, so um, that's in the, the one end of the building there, I guess. They also yeah. have some other um, family programs and uh, things like that. Oh, okay. So yeah, I was I never really knew what what kind of programming was offered there. And so uh, Andy Nelson, the executive director, 
said there's there doesn't seem to be any document that governs this relationship between Impact Northwest and the, and the county. And um, uh, and that is kind of a, a, a metaphor for this whole situation. You know, we don't seem to have any any kind of records for BDNA earlier than 2004. So Chelsea, you you have faithfully posted everything that you could find, the minutes and everything on our drive. And I've been looking through them. Uh, but there's nothing the, the um, chair and vice chair or the chair and the treasurer, um, Eric and Robin Wyckoff, they took all of the paper records that were available and uploaded them to the drive. Oh. So everything that they had is up there. And before that, I don't know where any records are. It's so strange that so many years should be missing. I mean, I think the uh, nonprofit of which BDNA was a part was formed in something like 1995. And then the building went, um, began, the construction began on the building in, I think, 1997 and it opened in 98 or it opened in 97 and construction began in 96. I don't remember exactly now. That's something we do know. But, um, you know, that's a, from 1995 through 2003, I mean, that's a lot of missing records, right? Uh, Stephanie, and, um, I so, might have a kind of a, a clue on that. Um, when Eric and Robin, when Eric was president, I think briefly I was secretary and I ended up with this big thick yellow thing that says secretary on it, right? And um, there's a lot of stuff in here. I'd love to see it. So, wow. Yeah. So oh. who wants it? Who who am I dropping this off to oh, tomorrow? Just Stephanie, please. Yeah. Stephanie Frederick. Or, okay. or I'll be glad to come and get it from you if you'll no, tell I know where, I think I know where you live. So yeah, five six one eight Southeast Malden. Yeah. Yeah. And there are some random folders and records in our cupboards at the BDN. I looked. I looked. But that's the only other I, record I through, that was given. I, lo I looked through everything in our in our kitchen cupboards. I figured and, you'd already checked there. Um, and yeah. Gail said construction was 95, 96 and opened in 97. Oh, okay, fine. Thank you. All right. So um, one of the, um, one of the, the, the really uplifting and promising things that Andy had to say was that he's very interested in the building becoming more of a true community center for, for, Be for Brentwood Darlington. And uh, he said he wants to erase the mystery of it and make it something that we, we use and know. And I asked him if it would be possible even someday to, to maybe have one morning a week where it's just drop in for a neighbor's morning, come and have coffee, and then you can run into people you've never, you'd never otherwise meet, right? It would just be a community meeting um, place for three hours every Wednesday morning or something like that. He was very open to that concept. Um, I would suggest um, two. I would suggest one for parents with small children and one for people without children. Yeah, okay, no, that's not a bad idea. So- um, Oh, and Lee has a question when you have a second. Okay, go ahead. I was actually just about to um, say what Chelsea mentioned. Um, I was the recreation coordinator at Montevilla Community Center and we had uh, once a week, and it might've been twice a week, a uh, drop-in hour for um, uh, very young children and parents. To and bless you for that, we used it so much. It was $1.25 and you had one of the best ones in the city. You do not know how much those open little small open gyms saved my sanity over the last few years when he was little enough. It but, was uh, it was one of my favorite things to do there and setting up all the little gyms and obstacle courses and balls to play with but it's a it's a great way for um, community uh, members neighborhood uh, people to meet each other. We had regulars and it was just so much fun. And I would highly recommend separating out the adult uh, meet and greets and the children's play gym <laughs> for everybody's, everybody's happiness. 
Yeah, no, no, that makes that makes a lot of sense. And um, <clears throat> we're you know, maybe this with Laura Lee's experience on this as we move into more conversations with Andy, we mm -hmm. can expand some of her programming knowledge to um, what would work in that size of a space as we discuss what we want from the, our community center. Mm -hmm. If Laura Lee's willing, of course. Okay, great. Thank you, Laura Lee, for being a resource in yet another area. Oh my goodness. That... Okay, so one of the missing documents was a memorandum of agreement that Mary Davis remembers existed between BDNA and Impact Northwest. And unless it's in Derek's mystery folder, we don't, we don't know, we don't have any access to um, what was in it, but it looks as though it probably specified our privileges because we have a key to the building. Um, we, uh, we may use the space there without paying a fee and we have a mailbox. We can store stuff in the kitchen. Thank you, Chelsea. And we use the BDCC as our address. Um, but I'm thinking that in return for that, there were probably some responsibilities. And I remember in 2017, we paid to refurbish the floors of the community center. And our, min our minutes show, our approved minutes show that it was, um, we considered it to be a responsibility, but um, of, of ours. So I suspect that this missing, this mystery memorandum of agreement specified privileges and then in return for those privileges, some responsibilities, which I, to me makes perfect sense for an agreement. And um, I wanna, so, let me clarify on the floor cleaning. Uh, we don't have anything that requires us to clean the floors, but when we made that decision as the board, we um, felt that it was our responsibility to um, contribute to the upkeep of the community center, especially in light of that year they had been vandalized over multiple nights with broken windows, which had decimated the um, maintenance budget for that year. And the floors were in particularly bad shape. So mm -hmm. just clarifying that there's there was nothing that told us we had to do the floors, but we felt our responsibility since we use the community center so much to contribute towards it when they didn't have the finances available. Oh, I remember I the, the floors are pretty dirty. I mean, it, you know, it was like distracting. Well, they, they it was, we had them refinished because they had the gouges and everything. It had, mm -hmm. it had gotten out of hand. And when we asked what we could do to help, that was what, um, uh, I'm blanking on the names, but the building director before Russell, that was what she indicated would be the most helpful at the time. Um. Okay, so I all right, I didn't understand that. So thank you for clarifying that. But I also but I, I still suspect that this memorandum of understanding was likely to have some responsibilities in it. And so um well I'll look in Derek's folder and see. Maybe it's there. But in any case, uh uh Andy Nelson, the executive director of Impact Northwest suggested that we create a new memorandum of agreement between us. And so this will be our chance to say how we would like to um, um, make use of the building that would be on the privilege side. And then what, what we can offer um, for that privilege. And um, so one thing that he mentioned was um, maybe we could sponsor an annual grounds cleanup which um, I think would be um, an event that we could get, you know, we, we could call residents to come and help us weed and rake and sweep and, and just clean the place up, say every spring or something. It, it could be a, um, a fun, oh, Gail is saying she did that one year. Okay, that could be a fun thing to do for, for residents to be taking care of their own, of their community center, right? It's just a way of caring and and um, and learning about the center and feeling that you you belong to it and it belongs to you. And um, but then we might also be willing to um, to do some other things as well. So I propose that we we pull together a draft and start discussing this. There's no immediate hurry because of the especially because of the pandemic, but um, 
I think this is a chance to work with um, Impact Northwest on a very positive, friendly footing and to um, ha be more involved in the community center. Um, oh, then there's another thing that maybe we could help with that, that sign out front is in miserable shape. I've and been told that it's slated for replacement with their new logo. I asked about it a couple months ago, but I'm not sure what the time frame is on that. Oh, okay. All right. Um, well, anyway, I'm, I maybe Chelsea, you and I could work on a preliminary draft and um, have a memorandum of agreement and uh, I and think get the ball be a, a great discussion topic at our all committees meeting. Sure. And in the meantime, we can kind of talk to neighbors about, you know, if if it was a Parks and Rec community center or it operated differently, what would you hope to get out of it? Like if you walked into the community center, you would expect X, Y, Z. Um, and we can do some, maybe some informal uh, questioning to have some ideas of what neighbors are hoping for. And then um, also we can think about what we are willing to offer and what we're able to offer. Right. And I think we could do some sort of event still later in the year, maybe something outside. Maybe we could paint and repair the fence around the little yard that's falling down or, um, you know, plant flower bulbs or there's there's other things we could do where we could still be safe so mm -hmm. yeah okay great all right well so all right I'll look forward to that discussion at, at all comms but I think um I think this new executive director is he's just very friendly open and seems very willing to um uh eager I would say even to um to have a different slant a different approach to the way the community center is managed. So uh, I think we're, we, we should uh, take advantage of, <laughs> of him, right? Not, not to his detriment, of course, but it, all right, good. So we'll talk about that in, um, at all comms. And then, hold on just a minute while I, um, okay, so then I wanted to report on awards made by the Portland Clean Energy Community Benefits Fund. And this was um, a fund uh, that's, whose money comes from taxing businesses around town. And the whole idea is to benefit low, uh, I mean, minority and uh, low income people uh, uh, in connection with clean energy use and climate benefits and so on. So recently, the city council awarded um, hundreds of thousands of dollars in grants. And I just wanted to tell you uh, three recipients that, um, that would be not known to us or, you know, or we're happy for them. Um, one is the Black Food Sovereignty Coalition, got a planning grant for almost $100,000. And of course, that's our Black, that the Black Futures Farm is a, a member of that coalition. And so we'll be benefiting from this clean energy money. So I'm, I'm really happy for, um, for our Black Futures Farm here in our, our center. And then the Vose Workers' Rights Education Project got a $100,000 planning grant. It, isn't that nice? Yeah, no, that's exciting. And then something that I just learned about called the Community Energy Project got a a lot of money for planning and uh, not it for planning, but it's for energy efficiency or renewable energy category. And what this project does is fabulous. It, it has, it's um, geared to um, help low income people, although anyone may join it, but the benefit, but low income people get um, more benefit from it. It allows low income people to, uh, get credit for, for electricity produced in solar installations that are out where the sun shines. So people who don't have their own roof or their own backyard or their own way of, um, of putting in panels and producing electricity can nevertheless connect to this electricity uh, production elsewhere. It's credited on their um, uh, electricity bills and they, everyone who, who is in the low income category 
uh, will see their monthly bills lowered. So two things happen. They, they get less expensive electricity, plus they have the um, ability to connect with an exciting uh, program that is you know, a solar, solar powered electricity. It's the only requirement is that they must be a customer of um, PGE, Pacific Power, or Idaho Power, one of those three. And, um, and do they have to sign up or is it an automatic? Thing? No, they're, no, you have to sign up. And so I only just learned about this. You know, I'm working my way through the city's climate action plan, the city county climate action plan. And so I learned about the concept of community solar where you can, you can connect to electricity that is produced elsewhere. Uh, and I, I thought this was very exciting. And so then I signed up for a little seminar the other night and um, okay, it's called the Community Energy Project is the name of it. And, um, and I learned quite a bit about it, but I have more to learn. But once we learn it, once I master it, uh, I would like us to, um, help our low income people, well, in fact, everybody know about it, but especially those in our, our, our neighborhood who are lower income people. This is um, a really wonderful, wonderful program. And um, it's subsidized in part uh, by rate payers. And they showed me how to find my contribution on my PGE bill, and it's four cents a month, but over millions of customers, however, or hundreds of thousands, it adds up and it makes this program um, possible. So I love the idea that um, those who, who um, like me, can afford electricity are helping people who are lower income to also be able to um, connect with clean, with clean energy. And, um, so anyway, they, they got a grant of almost $900,000 to um, help the residents of Portland connect to solar produced electricity, um, even though they, you know, they, the residents themselves may not be able to put in solar. So anyway, I was very uh, excited about that and I'm, I'm looking forward to when I have enough knowledge about it so I can share it with all of you and then we can start getting it out to our neighbors. Right. Okay. Another one that would be really good to do as a brochure insert and hand out with Soak It Week events. If, yeah, well, okay. We'll, we'll have to see how much time Stephanie has to um, devote to this because as you know, I have another something else going on here, so. It's all good, uh, I'm just teasing you, Stephanie. Oh, okay, fine, all right. <laughs> that, uh, <laughs> Then uh, I wanted anything else. Are there any? Yeah, I do have a few more things. Okay. Is, there, is there enough time? I'll hurry. Uh, yeah, yeah, move it a little bit. <laughs> okay. okay, just real fast. Portland Clean Air, Greg Bourget. Do we sign these letters or not? Do we continue with Greg or not? I want to postpone our a full discussion or any discussion of this to the next meeting or or the meeting after. There's no hurry. But Pam and I are still looking through these letters and reading, learning how Greg operates and trying to figure out whether we should connect with him a little bit, very gingerly or not at all, or should we, are there neighborhood associations worthy of support, which they do seem to be. So we need to figure out, we need, we need to uh, learn more and figure out um, the strategy before we, um, come back to the board on this. So, all right, so later uh, on Portland Clean Air and Greg Bourget and the, and the letters that we don't remember signing. Okay, so um, parks real fast. The city council voted unanimously to exempt uh, parks, parks, parking lots, golf courses, wetlands, forests and other natural spaces in our city from um, being sites for the shelters that um, um, you know we hope to to create in other spaces for homeless people, but um, the, the um, community at large in Portland felt it was really really important to um, to not subject our parks to um, 
to two camps. And um, but there was one interesting comment in this article I read: uh, shelters would, however, be allowed to pop up at indoor community centers. So I don't know what that means. I'll find out because that could uh, that could be relevant to us, right? Stephanie, is that like? like the Mount Scott Community Center? Because I believe that's what they're doing now, right? Oh, I don't know. Well, yeah, I and believe they are I, currently... I walk around there and I, I believe the, there, there's a homeless uh, program going on there. That's what uh -huh. they're, yeah, it's, it's, they're not doing any swimming or anything there now. And I, and I know there's a lot of people in the parking lot. My wife and I walk around that block where the park is and so we see different groups out there and it looks like they're using the building. So uh, okay. they have been at least um, during the start of the pandemic. I know they were using it for some temporary housing and right. I don't think that has ended yet. Yes. Okay, well, and my question is, would our community center become a, a, a site? I don't think, well, that'd be a good question, but I don't think it's big enough. <laughs> there's, it's not big enough. It isn't big enough. And there's opinion. no showers. So I think, yeah. I think it's the shower aspect because I think East Portland Community Center has also opened up during uh, COVID for, um, for shelters. And, and I think that they did choose the community centers that had um, restrooms and shower, which are usually the ones with the pools, so. Oh, okay, that makes sense. All right, well then I won't. I'm going to stop worrying then. All right. And stop. I will okay. respect that because ours is also through Impact Northwest and not Parks and Rec that it's not on the table in the same way. Oh, that's a good point, Chelsea. I didn't think of that. Yeah. 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 Okay. Fine. All right. Okay. Real fast on streets. Uh, Peabot has started monitoring speeds and volume, traffic volumes on Playable Drive. Uh, unfortunately, they're doing it right when uh, Clackamas County began construction or road work um, on Linwood. And so the, it looks as though the traffic volumes are down just when, um, you know, people aren't, aren't going up Linwood and then up onto Flavel, Flavel Drive the way they usually do because of this road work. That might to change with the uh, limited in-person instruction at least somewhat that starts next week. For schools, well, just one one of the um, one of the activists on on Flavel Drive just said that she's she's seeing fewer cars right now, and uh, because and she attributes it to this uh, road work that's blocking traffic to some extent um, to the to the south. But we'll see. Uh, but anyway, I walked by there today and I see that they do have um, their 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 wires laid out across. Um, uh, Flavel Drive. I would have chosen right in front of the park because that's where I think people really speed up, but they've got them further to the east, uh, coming out, just coming out of the that S curve there. Um, so anyway, we'll see. We'll see what happens uh, with that data collection. At least Peabody is, you know, has acknowledged that we have a big problem on, on Flavel Drive and, and is is responding to that. Uh, then, uh, Chelsea, you, you told me earlier today that uh, Peabot has installed speed bumps on Duke Street, and this will be, this is good news for Ken DeLeo, right, Ken? Yes, I was actually going to raise my hand and ask you uh, what that was a result of. I saw them the other day. Well, there, there must have been other people in, um, putting pressure on... Um, on Peabot and maybe Mount Scott Arleta as well. I don't know, Matthew, mm -hmm. are you still there? <laughs> <laughs> I don't they think they're still with us. I, oh, okay. They're not part of Safe Routes to School, but I think they're part of some of the other safety initiatives that they've been, they've had going on. Mm -hmm. Well, we were gonna turn our attention to Duke Street. And yeah. But now maybe we won't have to. I went and got the radar gun back from Ryan. Yes. And, and uh, <laughs> because they've only done it after 72nd. So I don't know if they're coming anywhere closer to like 63rd and 52nd, which I mean, I don't think anyone likes speed bumps, but it's just so out of hand. Yeah, no, uh, it, uh, clearly it, it must be out of hand if, if they've actually put in speed bumps. So, um, right. I believe you. <laughs> that has been yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay, well, we'll see. You know, you just can't let, let us, I don't live up there, so I don't see the traffic. So let us know if things get better, okay? Oh, I will. I will. And I'll be in touch with you about the speed gun. <laughs> okay. All right. Very good. Um, let's see. Uh, oh, and real fast on um, the, uh, on this handout that I, I'm trying to prepare um, that help, would help uh, residents of our neighborhood deal with nuisance houses. Um, I have ended up talking with someone at Civic Life who's offered to help us with it. And this person has been, was not the, he, uh, I, I, I allowed him to see this list at his request. And um, I expected him to just reject it out of hand that, oh no, you can't hand this around to your neighbors. But instead, he thinks it's going to be a very valuable resource and he offered to, um, to help me uh, word it more professionally. And, and, um, and so he has some suggestions and, uh, and, and will be sending that to me. And I was very grateful. This, this man was very intelligent, very straightforward, and he looks like a wonderful person to connect with. So I was um, really pleasantly surprised because it's not, the kind of I don't know, level of competence that I've come to expect from, from civic life is way above. And um, uh, so anyway, I, I know Derek that you're interested in, in, um, in having this list. So we're gonna get it to you as soon as, as possible, but I do want mm -hmm. to fix it because it's in very rough form right now. And when I prepared it, I was in, I was in a disgruntled mood and, um, and it shows in the language and, and we don't want that. We want something non-committal and professional. And, um, mm -hmm. and so we're going to fix it, but the contents are, are, are good. All of the, the phone numbers and URLs, they all work. I checked them and so did this Steve Witcherly. And so it's just now we're down to presentation. We also learned though that civic life is not gonna help people anymore with nuisance houses. So they with their they he told me that they they withdrawn that assistance to the community. So that's unfortunate, but we can still reach out to um, the neighborhood uh, response team at the in the East Precinct, Portland, you know, police uh, East Precinct, and uh, uh, if when we have nuisance houses, you know, we can help neighbors set up a set up relationships with the neighborhood response team and begin feeding them information. And, and the handout explains what kind of data to collect and, and um, um, what's important and what isn't and so on. So we're gonna do our best to help people in the neighborhood here. And it looks like we're gonna get some help uh, from Civic Life. So I was very excited about that. And then, okay, Chelsea, why don't I stop now? Yeah, okay. Okay. Um, I, I think it's interesting that Civic Life is no longer going to do nuisance houses. I'm beginning to wonder what programs they have left at this point. <laughs> mm. I, yeah, I don't, I don't know. But in any case, he was just very honest with me, very straightforward, and, and but is helping mm -hmm. us nevertheless. He's still helping us. Yep. So anyway, and go ahead, Derek. That ready, we'll format it up and we'll make it so that it's uh, something we can hand out. Yeah, Great. it'll be a good service. Yeah. Okay. okay. All right. I'm going to go ahead and let Derek talk about the snapshot real fast. And Derek, will you also update us on when brochures should arrive? Sure. Oh, I have brochures. So, hey, I guess I should have said something earlier. But Next time you swing by, will you dump a chunk of them in my mailbox for me? I am totally out and people okay. want them. Well, I'll be doing my drop bys tomorrow then. I'm going to actually tomorrow's my out and about day. So I'm visiting a lot of people. Um, and just to share with you real quick, uh, you're looking at this map. Thank you. Who did this? Was this you, Chelsea? Or Yeah. Okay. Uh, great job. So yeah. what you're looking at is that's a snapshot in our neighborhood. Now the black box is things that have sold, but that's only in the last 30 days. If I went further than that, then this whole thing would be, you know, crazy. Oh, right. There's been um, so lots. the yellow are sale pending, right? And so what people ask me what that is, and sale pending is simply, it's under contract, uh, and it's somewhere in the escrow period. Escrow period with a loan is somewhere from 35 to 45 days. 
If it's a cash offer, it could be like 21 days or less. There's no appraisal, right? Just a little more, uh, less, less to do there. Um, and then of course the green or the active listings, one place um, I'm gonna be going by is on the very bottom. If you see the one for 785, <laughs> if, if you're curious what that is, what is that's, it? Some, that's proposed, right? It's a five bedroom house. It looks very, I call it like a dwell house. I don't know if you're familiar with dwell magazine. It's the yeah. opposite from a craftsman. <laughs> it's very boxy, linear, lots uh -huh. of glass, maybe even a flat roof. Um, but it, it's, um, if, you, if you just grab the address from the other sheet, or can we see the other sheet too? Um, oh, this is the only one I put up because uh, oh. you can't really read the text. I only put the graphic up for you. Okay, gotcha. Well, on that other sheet, but it's all broken down. And if anyone cares to see that, I can always share that with other people. I actually, I shared it with a lot of the board members earlier when I sent out an email to you. Um, but you can see the days on the market and so on. So it's a really indicator of the, we have very limited inventory at this time. Right. And so you've got a lot of buyers looking for few sellers. We have, um, you know, there's some people are moving out of the Portland area uh, because they're retiring and trying to buy something and they're going up to Kelso Longview or wherever, but the suburbs under a lot of pressure as well. But our prices are really kind of shooting up there. Another factor is the low interest rates. Um, I've been talking to my lenders, people that have refied, let's say a year ago or purchased a house, so much has changed that they're refining. And so my escrow person who does a lot of support for me with my transactions, she's slammed. So a lot of times I can't even talk to her on the phone because, you know, even though, well, it's already the end of the month, but about mid, she's just slammed with all the refi business right now. So heads up. But so, um, yeah. So Derek, can I ask you two questions? Sure. One, yeah, is it okay if I attach your two documents to my little newsletter that I send out? Yeah, that's fine. Just, okay. uh, and of course, uh, feel free to put my contact info as well. Sure. Um, and so, you know, people can follow up with me, ask questions. Um, I'm also to share with you, I'm sending out a little postcard uh, to people as far as, you know, it's for sellers. It's like, you know, what's my house worth? And probably just to share with you, I sent out many thousands to uh, in the 97206 zip code. Oh. And especially people that are um, that don't live at the property. So typically the rental property, right? So I did uh -huh. a mailing throughout the zip code about a couple of weeks ago. I've gotten quite a few contacts and they're people that have, a lot of them have like vacant lots and land. Some of them have rundown houses and they're trying to figure out what what's their house worth to who? I mean, is it worth something more to developers or is it some worth something to be rehabbed and developed? Uh -huh. And so that's a kind of a project I've um, been caught up in with property owners wanting to know what are they doing? I'm also reaching out to the city planners at city of Portland. There's some changes in zoning that's coming in, I believe, August of this year. Yes. So I'm just trying to keep current on what's going on. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's really kind of surprising. And I've, I'm not a new agent, but it, it's just kind of like you're looking at the market thinking, you know, well, how, how does this get sustained? Well, there's a lot of influx of people coming in with money. You know, uh -huh. it's because I the see. wages haven't gone up, right? <laughs> I mean, right. The prices is really shooting up. And then developers are really looking at our area very closely. So the one for 785, for example, if you go look at that other sheet that has the address on it, um, and you just do it, if you anyone, if you take any address and Google it, it'll put you on like realtor.com or Redfin or Zillow. But you'll see the photos are all, they're not actual photos. They're like, like a builder, new construction. Like a, yeah. What's that? And they're renderings. Yes, rendering. Thank you, Chelsea. And Derek, I uploaded that document to our shared drive, and there's a link now in the chat for anybody who wants to view the full document. Sure. And you'll see the days on the market, active listings. We never know if something's priced right or not, but things that are sale pending, if something like if I go in there and I see sale pendings, average days on the market are. Um, let's say you'll see average days on the market is something like five uh, to six days on the market. So 
that is a seller's market, not a lot of inventory. And for example, when it says five to six days, my most recent listings, I sold something on 69th, a couple of houses north of Harold by the Mount Scott Community Center. Um, I put it on the market the day before the snowstorm Thursday. We had the <laughs> snowstorm on Friday and I was getting calls from agents over in the west side. They couldn't drive over here to show it. So I, I my car has snow tires. So I was going out there showing it to their buyers. And oh my I was out there, but I was also shoveling this, the steps, right? And putting the de-icer so no one would slip on the front porch. And uh, But anyway, long story short, my offer review date was Monday at 6. But because of the snowstorm, I extended it to Thursday. So it was on the market there. But we ended up with five offers. Uh, we ended up selling it, um, I want to say, 15000 over list price. And um, so wow. it was very successful for that. And that buyer is somebody he bought in 2013 during the recession. And um, I helped him buy it. And um, I think he got laid off from Comcast and he wanted to move out of Portland, you know, so, but he did quite well. So anyway. Wow. Things are All jumping. Right. You're busy. <laughs> and I'm busy. Yeah. And if anyone has questions like tomorrow, uh, well, I'm going to drop by and see you, Chelsea, and you, Stephanie, but uh, I'm going to be looking at that house, the one on Flavel Drive that's for, uh, I forgot what is that price. Um, it's like uh, oh, eight hundred and seventy-four thousand. <laughs> so I'm curious to see where the lot is. I'm I'm curious at that price what kind of view it has. So uh, I'm going to be driving out there tomorrow, just kind of walk the lot. I'm assuming it's probably a vacant lot or something, or who knows? There might be a a, a small rundown house or something. Um, okay. I know, but it'll be interesting. I'm just curious what kind of view it has to the south. Anyway. An eight hundred thousand dollar view, yeah. Well, I would think something like Malcolm and Susan's house, where we uh, used to have the board member retreat. Oh right, yeah. Yeah, something you know, something like that maybe. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. I bet. All right, we're coming up on nine o'clock. Is there anything else that needs to be talked about before we all go for the evening? Eric, I want to thank you for that uh, report on the real estate. It's really interesting, and that information is going to help us as we move into the TGM planning process, too, I think. Yes. Mm -hmm. so. All right. Um, before we go, I want to let you know that there is now a document in the agendas and slides folder. So that's in that, that very first link of the public records that we put up at the beginning of the meeting. If you go look at where the slides are in there, there is a document for the last three meetings with all of these links that we're putting in the chat. So if you just want the links from the chat, there's now documents available. Oh, that's fabulous. Okay, thank you, Chelsea. Well, I send them to Maria in a document, so I figured we would just share it, so. All right, a reminder that all committees has moved to 6 p.m. We're meeting on April 20th. You also want to make sure and go to land use at on April 8th at 7 p.m. And if there is nothing else, I will see everybody next month for elections and I'll see y'all in the meetings in the meantime. Have a great night, everyone. Thanks for coming. Terrific. Okay, thanks Thank so you. Much.